It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Jonathan Seidel, and we're going to be discussing his new book, Finding Rest, A Survivor's Guide to Navigating the Valleys of Anxiety, Faith, and Life. John, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. What a great, uh, what a great introduction. And hopefully, I don't know what bucket do I fall in. Do I fall into shiny object? Maybe spirituality. I guess we'll see. Yeah, well, you know, we'll we'll try to ride that fence between shiny objects, spirituality, and just make it fun for the whole family and folks of uh, all interest levels. I guess uh, this is the first time you and I are meeting. I know you're going to be brand new to most of my audience, so let's kick this off by having you share a bit of the Jonathan Seidel origin story. So. For all of us meeting you for the first time in our talk today, give us a few things we need to know about you. I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, uh, just about 35 minutes south of Green Bay on Lake Michigan. And so I am an avid Packers fan. Even my wedding ring uh, has Packers on it. <laughs> nice. My wife doesn't always really like because she's a Cowboys fan. And um, so grew up there. I went to, I was one of five kids. Um, so not the 10 like you have there, Sean, but um, I went to college in New York City. So I left small town Wisconsin and there I was in the middle of Manhattan and um, was there, met my wife there, got married after school, went back to New York City, well, spent a total of about seven years in New York City and uh, came down to, to Dallas area um, for work. Um, I was at a news website that kind of moved their headquarters down here. And I've been in Dallas ever since. So since about 2012, I have been here in Dallas. So I have two kids, been married for going on 13 years. And to my wife, Brett, um, who I said is unfortunately a Cowboys fan, but she is from Texas. So I guess that's a given. Um, And uh, besides the two kids who are six and three, I have two dogs. And uh, so that's that's kind of the overview of uh, my life. I've been in digital media for as long as I can remember. And so that's been my world, uh, the, the online news and social media and uh, digital consulting uh, is what I do. I guess you could say full time r- right now, but I'm really writing now and um, and then consulting on the side um, as, you know, just as people need it, because I really want to help people. So. That's me in a nutshell. In a nutshell. There we go. Uh, in terms of having a passion for storytelling, like how did that like get planted in you? When did you realize that was a thing? Like how did you get started telling other, well, telling your own stories and also telling other people's stories? Yeah, it's a great question. Cause I think as long as I can remember, I've always um, been someone who asked questions. And so in fact, uh, uh, this was a few years ago, but um, some buddies and I spent a weekend in New Orleans and we were driving back and um, I was just, just talking to my friend, you know, and uh, he stopped me. He goes, has anyone ever told you, you ask really good questions? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I just, I'm curious. Right. And so the, the, the affinity for storytelling, I think really starts in good questions, right? You can't get someone to tell you their story if you're not asking good questions. And so I also remember a time when we were about 12 years old and I actually wrote this story in the book. It's, um, we had gone up to, I don't know, this was, it was winter or something like that. And we were driving around in a carriage and uh, I love horses. And so I asked my parents and the carriage driver, if I could sit up in front with her as she drove the carriage. And she said, yeah, absolutely. And so I sit down and by the end of the, by the end of the carriage ride, this, this carriage driver, again, I was about 12 years old is like, had told me her entire life story talked about her divorce, like all this kind of stuff. And my mom's like, how did you do that? I go, I don't know. I just ask questions, right? I'm interested in stories. So that's that I would say that's from its earliest um, conception. That is where my drive and love for storytelling um, started. I've always been someone who loves the details, right? There's nothing that annoys me more than my wife. Like, you know, so I talked to Bob today and he told me this. And I'm like, well, what was Bob like when you talked to him? What was his demeanor? Well, you know, like I'm always wanting the de- the details, and um, and so you know, when I got to college, I started writing, and I didn't think. I mean, 
I didn't like grow up like someone who was just like always in a book, just like always writing like, you know, 30 page essays. Like, no, I didn't really like it. But when I started writing creatively, it like something switched. And so I remember my college writing class, I, I, t- we had a creative writing assignment. I told this story about just like the difference between living in Wisconsin and New York. And my college writing professor said, um, this is really good. I was like, oh, really? I, I didn't know it was really good. You know, he's like, no, it's really good. And lo and behold, I sent it to my hometown paper in Wisconsin. And they're like, this is really good. Can we publish this? And I'm like, sure. And so I got published, you know, as a freshman in college. And I was like, wow, that was pretty cool. <laughs> you know, I think I want to tell stories for a living. It still took me a little bit. You know, I grew up wanting to be the press secretary of the United States. Like that was my ultimate dream and goal. Now you can probably pay me enough money to do that. <laughs> um, but that was that was my thing. And uh, and so then God just kind of had um, another another plan, another outlet for me. And I took it. Talk to us a little bit about anxiety and OCD and creatives, because like all of my friends are authors and creatives just about a, a, of one stripe or another. And I, I just I can think of I could like list out 10 or 15 of them that they, they struggle with anxiety. They're very OCD about things. Or, or, is there a correlation there? I don't know if it's, I, I don't want to like draw. I'm, I'm, I'm trying much. to force you to paint with a very broad yeah. brush. <laughs> <laughs> well, but here's what I will say. Here's what I'll say. And I talk about the, this in the book is that my anxiety and OCD, like God has been faithful enough to redeem them in, mel- in multiple ways, right? Amen. And one of those ways is the fact that I am someone that people love to work with, right? I am someone who, when I do get a, a creative thought in my head. You know, think about it. There, there's a lot of people who have creative thoughts in heads, right? Or <laughs> creative heads, <laughs> creative thoughts in their head, right? But maybe they lack the, you know, for me, if I have a creative thought in my head, I can't get it out of my head, right? I have to do something about it. So where maybe it just kind of dies with this person over here. For me, it's like, I have to, I have to express that. I, I can't stop thinking about it, right? I can't, I, you know, I ask, what if, what if I don't get this out? What will happen, you know? Um, and so I think that we, the anxiety and OCD sufferers tend to be really, um, uh, tend to be people who have to express themselves, have to get that out. And then tend to be people who not, not just meet, but exceed deadlines. You know, uh, when I was working with Kirk Cameron, it's like, you know, he would ask me for a presentation on something, you know, and, and I would give him this like beautiful, you know, Mac created on a Mac. That was, that's a, that's a wink to you, Sean, uh, since we were talking about that off air and, um, and it would be awesome. He'd be like, Oh my goodness, this is beautiful. Right. When he would send me an email, like I respond very quickly, right. It's not hanging out in the ether. Um, so I think there are actually, uh, examples of how people who are, who do struggle with these, uh, these things tend to be really good workers. And there's actually a really great book that I quote and mention in my book called The First Rate Madness. And it talks about how people with mental illness tend to be some of the best leaders and explains why. So yeah, so many of the people I know who are up on stages or doing amazing work, if you get to know them and get into their backstory, there's always something really interesting and unique there. People often don't get to those uh, high levels of creativity or accomplishment without walking through difficult valleys. It's just part of the journey. Uh, and, and also, I, I really love what you're saying in terms of for creatives when, you know, you feel like you're pregnant with something like you can't move on to the next things to uh, the next thing until you get that out of you. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. a real a real creative frustration where you do have to birth that thing uh, before you can move on to the next. Um, in terms of like like telling your own story, what was it like to go? OK, and, and not that you haven't told parts of your own story in the past, but, you know, professionally, you've helped lots of amazing people tell stories. What was it like to pivot into being vulnerable and intentionally sharing more of your story? Yeah. Um, so, so I was first diagnosed back in about 2014. And for two years, I didn't talk about it. Um, I think there was always this fear in me. I didn't want to be the anxiety guy. And what I mean by that is I didn't want to be the person at work or in a conversation where someone said, where someone just had an excuse to dismiss me. You know, um, where someone could say, oh, John, you know, you're really harping on this point or, or, or this idea. 
well, that's just the anxiety talking, or that's just the OCD talking, so we don't really have to take that seriously. And I never wanted to be that guy. And so I was working at the time at I Am Second, uh, the Christian nonprofit that does a lot of films. And my job was to create a writing engine that rivaled the quality of the films. And it was, you know, I, I had built this team of contributors and writers who were, who were really talking about some deep and dark stuff. And, and the Holy Spirit was just kind of tapping me on the shoulder being like, John, you know, there's that thing. There's that thing you really need to talk about. Ah, no, I don't need to talk about that, you know. And finally, it just got like deafening, you know. And I was like, fine. So I like close my door in my office and I sit down and I don't even tell my wife that I'm going to be writing this. And I write it out. And um, it was it was freeing um, to tell my own story. It was still scary. But, you know, that doesn't mean it's not scary, but it was freeing. And the responses I got were just so incredible. Some of them were really sad and heartbreaking, just people who had, um, because I think this is something in the church that's not been dealt with historically well, right? Uh, people just told to have enough faith or just pray more, or, you know, there's maybe some unrepentant sin in their life that God is now punishing them. Um, all things that I had been told growing up as well. And, you know, so while it was freeing, it was also like, okay, there's a lot more here than even I realized. And which, so really in 2016, that was the impetus for the book. The book in the sense in, is as an idea, as a response, as a guide for Christians with mental health issues was really birthed out of that article that I wrote for I'm Second. Just took five years for it to finally come to fruition, which as you know, Sean, someone who may be working on a book, it does take time. So <laughs> yeah, you know, from a uh, contract to books being on shelves is usually at least a year and a half, sometimes 24 months. And then, uh, you know, especially if it's a first book, I, I feel like that can be a longer road just because you're having to do so many things for the first time. And, yeah. you know, it's one thing to express yourself in an article. It's another thing to express right. yourself coherently in a way that connects over 10 or 12 or 14 chapters. It's just like any other skill. You have to develop it over time. Um, in, in terms of, I guess, I, I'd like to pull a little bit more on the the identity thread of, um, you know, sharing about the anxiety. Because on the one hand, you know, you said you, you were worried about, you know, what, what people might think or how they might treat you. But like, I guess, bring us a little bit into that tension between you having to like own that as part of your identity but also not wanting other people to label you. Cause I feel like those were kind of two competing tensions a bit with what you just shared. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, especially in the beginning, I think right now I've just, I've become so comfortable with like, I'm doing, I'm walking in what I know the Lord has called me to do. So if someone wants to call me the anxiety guy, great, you know, put it <laughs> on a business card. Um, that's fine. Um, but I think it was, it was more so a fear of, of the stigma. So when I talk about a fear of being labeled, it's more a fear of the stigma. You know, I, I talk about in the book, just, just growing up and just kind of what the views on mental health were around my family um, and in the church and in the churches that I was brought up in. But it was, it was this idea that you were, you were not, you were, you were kind of a less than Christian, right? And so that's where that fear really, really came out. And so, but what I realized was that just, so it, the first chapter in the book is called Call It By Its Name. And so the idea is that we get power when we name something. We get power when we um, call it by its name, if you will, right? And so, I mean, this is, this is an idea and concept that goes back to Jewish culture. It goes back to the creation story, right? Where, where Adam was told to name the animal. And by naming the animals, he was asserting dominion over them, right? He was showing where, they are, where man is in the hierarchy of creation by naming the animals, right? And so for me... Once I named my disorder and named what was going on, it was actually, I say, one of the more freeing parts of my life because I was, was able to have power over it, right? And instead of just being blindfolded, the lights off and swinging in the dark, the lights were on, the blindfold were off, and I knew where I needed to aim my arrows, right? And so just like that moment of calling it by its name being freeing, the more that I talk about this and the more that we talk about our struggles, right? whether it's current struggles, whether it's past sins, whether it's, you know, whatever, the, the more that like, like the, the devil lives off of things in secret and in the dark, right? That, like, that's where everything just kind of festers and grows, right? But it is when it is in the light that those things die. 
and that we are truly, um, in a sense, allowing the Lord to use them for his glory and our good. And so the tension, I would say, is not there really as much anymore. But I mean, listen, I, I, I still go. I talk about this as an ongoing battle. Like there are still times where I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> I had someone who who just wanted to trash the book on Amazon, you know, over the weekend. And like there were some old anxiety habits that came up as I read that, you know, um, so that that that's kind of how I would explain the tension and, and, and saying that the tension right now is is not as prevalent. And it's more, you know what? God, if I'm the anxiety guy, if I'm the OCD guy, if I'm the storytelling guy, whatever you want, use it. Well, the one thing I always say kind of about haters on Amazon and social media, uh, the encouragement I give authors when they come to me like, oh, I got a really bad review. I'm like, yeah, but you provoke somebody enough that they responded. You may not like their response. You may have like touched that festering wound or that pet peeve that is defining their life right now. But you provoke them enough that they actually are wrestling with it. You don't like what they're saying, but they're actually giving some thought mm. to what you put in the book. So, uh, I mean, haters come with the territory, but again, yeah. you know, as a longtime PR guy, Hey, conversation is conversation and good, bad, and in between, uh, it does bring attention to a message. You know, I, I don't, I don't ever want a hundred percent positive reviews. Cause then it looks kind of contrived or like you just paid a bunch of reviewers. Give me like 85 to 95% positive reviews and then a range of ones, twos, threes, fours of people saying, I like this, but didn't like that. So I feel like it gives a little bit more legitimacy to how people socially view a message, at least on Amazon, when they uh, make that judgment call based on the reviews. I'm going to write that down. Bad reviews, <laughs> legitimize. <laughs> Great. Okay. Awesome. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and if everybody else in PR says, Sean's ideas are really terrible. Well, you know, it's, it, it is my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> Book of Job. A lot of us don't really oh, know yes. what to do with the Book of Job. Um, you know, on the one hand, we get all lost on what's happening uh, with the angels and God, and then we get lost in what's happening with Job's friends. But uh, for you, how, how did how did you wrestle with the Book of Job in terms of making sense of your anxiety and OCD? I feel like that's an important part of the book. Changed my life, right? I dedicate a whole chapter to what I call the most important book of the Bible. Please don't write me emails, right? You'd be like, well, what about the resurrection of Jesus and Matthew? Help like, me understand important. Job's friends now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but for me, because I did grow up in a tradition that was very, what I, what I call now very works-based, right? That said, if you did this, then God will do, then God will do this. If you don't do this, God won't do this, right? Right. And um, so to, to, to read Job, and there's, a, there's just a few things that have blown my mind as I've continued to read that is, one of them, get this, you know, people talk about, okay, the devil goes to God and God says, yeah, you want to, you want to strike down Job? You can do anything but kill him and see, he doesn't curse me. I'm kind of gloss over that. But what you don't realize about the book of Job, and I, and I didn't really realize this, it's not the devil that brings up Job to God. God brings up Job to the devil. God says, have you considered Job? Like, even just that one little nugget is fascinating to me, right? That God's like, Think about it. He's a great guy. You want to test him? <laughs> like, like what? Holy cow. You know, so little nuggets like that. You know, the other nugget is um, as Job goes through and struggles that God reserves the harshest uh, judgment for Job's friends who said, Job, you did something to deserve this. And, 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 God, and God's like, I think I think he even says my my anger has burned against you uh, to to Job's friends, right? So that's the second thing. No, the harshest judgment in Job was reserved for those who said it's your fault. You've done something to deserve this. And the third thing is, and I think, you, you know, we look at Job and we say, okay, you're going to go through a tough time, and like Job got twice as much stuff as he ever had. And we're like, yeah, I want that. Like, okay, give me the trial. Yeah, okay, if I'm going to get a million dollars at the end of this, sure, you know. And what we forget is two things. One, first of all, that, that, that mention of Job getting twice as much stuff, it's, it's like a footnote. It's like an aside. It's like it comes at the very end and it's like, oh, and by the way, he got like twice as much stuff, right? It's not the main focus of the end of the book of Job. So what is the main focus? It's that Job got more of God. Like that is the truly life-changing part of Job. In his struggle, it brought him closer to God it brought him closer to the realization that, by the way, God never answers Job why he, why he allowed this. You know, Job 
that Job 42 is some of the most beautiful, most poetic writing, I think, in the entire Bible. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I separated the seas from the land? You know, and it's just beautiful, right? And so in his struggle, he's brought closer to God. And in the end, it gets a more rich and vast understanding of who God is. And that relationship is incredible. And oh, by the way, he also got this, right? So those three things have been just life-changing for me, understanding that, hey, God will allow things to happen to us, right? I mean, you look at Paul, you look at the thorn in the flesh, right? And it's like, he prayed. You you think Paul didn't have enough faith for that to be removed? And whether, you know, I know there's like, was it a physical thorn? Was it a spiritual thorn? I don't care. It was a thorn, right? And so like Paul prayed for this to be removed, you know, Um, and it wasn't. And so there's something that I tell people that I think is foundational to the book. One is it's a proper theology of suffering. And what that means is we have to learn to not judge God by our circumstances, but judge our circumstances by who we know God to be. If we know he, he's loving, we know he's working all things for, for our good in his glory. It's not some evil, bad God up there. He does allow things in a fallen world to happen to us. And when he does, we have the rest to know that he is using them and he is faithful enough to turn those for our good and his glory. And sometimes that involves refining us and redefining us in the process. Yeah. Uh, it, it does kind of feel like uh, on the one hand, God was kind of baiting Satan into something. He's like, look at, look at Job, look at Job. So yeah. I'm glad you brought that out. And Job's friends definitely sound like how most of us were raised in the church. It's kind of the almost cause and effect. If you do this, then God that. and what I love about what you just described and, and what we see going on in the book of Job is we get to see how much more we're part of a much bigger unfolding story of what God is doing in the kingdom and in our own lives. It's not maybe as simple as that kind of cause and effect that Job's friends uh, were trying to go after. You know, I mean, you, you just, if you could boil it down, Job's friends all stare at him and point the pregnancy and be like, what'd you do? You know, yeah. and, uh, we've all been there in circumstances like that. And, um, and not just throw shade at any of my reformed friends. Um, I mean, I'm, I make my living and, and, uh, worship in the charismatic church these days, but, um, you know, I, I have seen so many people when life gets hard and they come up against difficult situations and they're like, but God, I've, 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 I, I signed the card. I've checked all the boxes. I've done all the right things. And, um, you know, like what God, why are you judging me? Why are you destroying my life? Like, that's where I feel like, um, you know, that's where theology and worldview really matter for how we process, how we wrestle. And I feel, you know, like, like looking at something like the book of Job, maybe to pull back and get a broader context of what's, what can be happening, uh, can be really helpful. Uh, so just throwing that out there. Any, any thoughts or response to that? No. Yeah. (laughs) I think, you know, one of the things that I talk about is there's a difference between God allowing and God causing, right? Mm, That's good. Um, a good God cannot cause evil. He can't, right? Then he's not a good God, right? And so if we, that's what I'm saying too about like defining our circumstances by who we know God is. And so if we know those foundational things, it's not God, you know, and, and, and I don't mean to get too granular here, but it does make a difference to say, is he allowing it to happen for something else, for something bigger, right? I mean, God can stop anything, right? He can, right? God could miraculously heal me tomorrow of these issues. I believe that. He hasn't, right? So I have to then I have to then define my circumstances by who I know he is and I know he's good and so, you know, there's something more that he wants me to learn in this. There's something more that he wants to do with me in this. And I can without a shadow of a doubt say that my relationship with God is nowhere near it was when I first was diagnosed with these issues. When I first understood what was going on, I am much more closer just like Job towards the end, I'm much more closer to God as a result of everything that he's allowed to happen. In terms of people interacting with using the book, um, I guess paint, paint your vision a little bit for, for the person who says, Oh man, I'm struggling with anxiety or this, that like they're, they're relating more to the mental health aspect of what we just talked about. Um, your vision for that person and the impact you'd like to see the book make on them. And also your vision for, leaders, people who are facilitating small groups, like uh, the leader and the reader. How do you want this book to be used? Impact. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I think a lot of what I'm hoping the reader takes from it is a lot of what we've talked about today. I think you've hit the nail on the head, you know, uh, uh, to one of the, the, the main chapters is why Job is the most important book of the Bible. Um, so I think that's important. The other thing that is important that I hope they take from this is um, that proper theology of suffering, which was a part of that. But then also I, I, I'm, I go through great lengths to say, you know, I think we live in a binary world right now, right? Where we want everything to be in either, or it's either a spiritual battle. It's either a physical battle. It's either this, or it's either that. And we have to be comfortable with the fact that we actually live in, an, in, in a both and world. And so I get some people are saying, this is all a spiritual battle. And I say, no, it's not. It's a physical and a spiritual battle. And some people will say, it's all a physical battle. No, it's not. It's a physical and a spiritual battle. Listen, I have spiritual issues that I know that I have that I continue to try to work out through the sanctification process, right? I know that I can be prideful. I know that I can want to control everything. I know that I can have a lack of trust in what the Lord says in the Bible to be true. But I can never address all those things until I address the physical aspect of what's going on with, you know, misfires in my brain, serotonin levels being different, all those kind of things, right? So for me, I, I do take medication. I, I'm not saying that everyone has to be taking medication, you know, but for me, it's a common grace that the Lord has given to us, just like antibiotics for when you have, a, you know, an infection. It's a common grace he's given me. It allows me, it takes my anxiety from an eight to a four and at a four. I can address the spiritual issues, right? I was talking to someone the other day and they said, um, they said, yeah, John, do you wear glasses? I said, yeah. He goes, it's kind of like, you know, someone telling you to read the Bible and without your glasses, you can't read it. And I'm like, yeah, but once you put your, you go to the doctor, you get glasses, you put your glasses on and, and what the doctor gave you, literally a prescription helps you read the Bible. Yes, I can't read the Bible until I get my, put my prescription glasses on, right? Um, so, so that doesn't mean though, that, that the, both of those things aren't in play, but there are physical things that I can do to address the spiritual things that I know are going on underneath that. And so what I, what, what then I, uh, apply to leaders or, or what I also say is loved ones, right? There's an entire chapter just for friends and loved ones of people who struggle is a, to understand fully what's going on from a physical aspect, from a spiritual aspect. So write an entire chapter for, to you dedicated to those things, as well as then telling you, hey, these are, these are words that are, that are really hurtful to people when they're going through anxiety. These are really hurtful words for people who, when they are going through OCD. Like, don't tell me to just get over it already. Like, I want to get over it. Trust me. I, it's, it's spinning in my head. I really do want to get over it, right? But that's not helpful, right? So what is actually helpful? And so that's that chapter in the book that, that I have, you know, I mean, I thought it was going to be helpful. That's why I wrote it. But I have been just blown away by even just a message I got yesterday from uh, a wife who said, you helped my husband finally put a name to what's going on. And now I finally have a way to relate to him. Um, and that's been just a really special treat. And in terms of your journey along the whole way with this project, uh, biggest challenge you had to overcome, most important thing you learned about yourself, like what, what's your takeaway from you know, putting all of your heart and soul into this project. So I make a point to say, listen, this is an ongoing battle for me, right? Um, I do not pretend to have overcome this. Has Jesus overcome this? Absolutely, right? Has he healed me of it? He hasn't. And so I, but I think sometimes, you know, just a few weeks ago, I had a panic attack, right? And there is a frustration of there, like, you're the anxiety guy writing a book on this. And here you are, you know, two weeks before launch having a panic attack, you know? But guess what that does, Sean? It forces me even more to rely on Jesus, right? It does. It forces me. My continued anxiety and OCD, which is obviously, I mean, it's much better. And I'm in a much better place than it was in 2016, right? 2014, I should say, when I was diagnosed. But as I continue to struggle, I am continually forced. To rely on Jesus. I heard a pastor once say, you know, I, I, <laughs> these atheists and, and people who don't believe in Jesus, they keep telling me religion is a crutch for the weak. And he's like, absolutely, it's a crutch for the weak. We're all weak. You just don't realize your legs are broken, <laughs> right? So um, I think that that is, that is what I am coming to learn, is that no matter how much I want to say and, and say I've kicked it, like, nope, still need to rely on Jesus. Well, and to some degree, I would say that's 
kind of a, a grace because one of the things I always say is if an author is having to live out their own message or turn back to what they're encouraging others to go after or follow, that gives me a lot of confidence that this book can actually help me mm. or can actually help my friends. So just hearing you say that this is an ongoing battle and you're literally having to turn back to what you're encouraging others to go after in the book to function and keep moving forward. That says to me that this is a book that can really help other people. If, if you were to say, yep, my problems are all solved. My life is perfect. Yeah. yeah I wrote this two years ago, but I, I barely remember what it's about. <laughs> That's not helpful. But if, if it's like a, a tangible, meaningful, different in your life day to day, then that, that's proof in the pudding that this book can help other people. Mm. Thank you. That means a lot. And that's a really good point. <laughs> well, and, and, that, and that's the thing you got to wrestle with. You kind of alluded to this earlier in the interview, just you're like, oh man, do I need to be the this guy or the that guy? I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. something I actually warn authors about a lot. It's like, okay, you're going to write about this. Just know that you're signing up to be the poster boy or poster girl for that topic. And everybody who meets you is going to expect that this is how you live your life, that you're maybe an authority here or, mm -hmm. you know, you're the walking embodiment of this message. So don't take lightly, you know, God, God may be asking you to write this, but it, like it's an assignment to, to really steward well. And so, um, I, I love that balance of, of what you've stepped into in terms of the book. And then just that you're still having to live out the message. Um, that's a powerful thing. So, mm -hmm. Anyhow. Well, yeah, I appreciate <laughs> that. And I, like, I, you know, uh, again, in one of those bad Amazon reviews are like, Oh, I can't believe Seidel says that he still struggles with it. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you're why I wrote the book, person. Like, that's exactly why I wrote the book. Because people who uh, pretend like it's all... And, and again, I want to be careful there. There are people who have been miraculously healed. Right. And, I will, and I will celebrate that. My God is a God of miracles. I know he can do it, right? But more often than not, what I'm finding is that this is an ongoing battle for a lot of people. And the majority of people who are trying to figure out how to fight this, it's an ongoing battle. And so that's what I, that's what I say is like me and you are friend sitting down to have a conversation about that. And here's what I have learned. And here's what the Lord has taught me. And I pray it is useful and helpful to you. And John, in terms of people connecting with you, finding out more about the book, where do we discover you on the web? You can go to findrestnow.com. That will give you all the ways that you can buy the book from Amazon to Walmart to Barnes and Noble to Target. Um, it'll, it'll show you all the ways. If you want to put it in a bulk order, I would not be upset. But uh, findrestnow.com is where you can go. And like we do with every episode, we'll have links in the show notes to places where you can connect with John and pick up your very own copy of his new book. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tappet Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Jonathan Seidel. Once again, our book today was Finding Rest, A Survivor's Guide to Navigating the Valleys of Anxiety, Faith, and Life. And John, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Sean. Anytime.